Um, I study marine and land snails. And people always ask me two questions. They always ask me, how in the world did you get involved studying land snails? Well, um, when I moved to the Gastonia area, I was so excited because I'd been to the Shield Museum many times and I thought I would love to volunteer at the Shield Museum in the collections department. And I wonder if they would like my big marine shell collection that I've been accumulating ever since I was a child, all through my college career and vacations and everything. It was all scientifically organized. So I offered it to the Shield Museum and they were excited to get a scientific collection and they said, we need a curator. <laughs> so I became the adjunct curator of malacology there. And after a while, they said, um, this, is, this marine collection of yours is wonderful, but we actually concentrate on the Piedmont. Is there anything you could do locally? And I said, well, there's land snails, but I don't know anything about them. So I, I found a mentor, um, the only other malacologist in North Carolina, and, <laughs> and together, piecing together the information that we knew about the Piedmont, which we found out was totally un... I mean, the, the records are very sketchy. Uh, there were some records, but they didn't cover all the species, and the distributions were very limited and, and didn't have... There were things there that they didn't know were there. So really started making some, some big finds early on in the Piedmont of North Carolina and found out it was really understudied as far as mollusks were concerned. But getting back to the second question I always get is how do you get rid of them? <laughs> and I promise I'll tell you before, <laughs> before I get finished how to, to get rid of them if you really have a problem in your garden and you, you have snails eating your plants. I'll tell you how to get rid of them, but hopefully by the end of the program, you'll decide maybe you don't want to. Okay? All right, well, let's get started. I do talk about snails and slugs because slugs are just snails that don't have shells, and we'll talk about that. So. Our native land snails are often overlooked, but important members of our environment, and I hope I can get that across today. Um, they have been understudied. It seems like every biologist has totally ignored snails and in, up until recent times. And uh, so there's very little records, and especially right here in Polk County, the, the records here are very limited. So there are some that had no records in North Carolina. So we've really made a lot of difference studying the land snails in the last 10 years that I've been studying land snails. Both snails and slugs are mollusks. And if you don't know what a mollusk is, um, we're going to talk about that. They are members of the pulmonate gastropods. A snail commonly refers to spiral-shelled mollusk. A slug is just a shellless species of snail. They um, arise in several lineages of snails. Not all slugs are related, but that particular family evolved to not have a shell. It, they adapted by not having a shell. Otherwise, the animal is the same. It's a snail. Phylum mollusca, where they all belong, is a very diverse phylum. It includes the octopus and clams and squid and all kinds of things. So if you say, oh, I, I won't eat snails, but if you eat clams and scallops <laughs> and oysters, well, it's the same animal. The gastropods are generally the ones that we see as land snails. They're called gastropods, literally stomach foot, um, because they look like they're crawling around on their belly, or at least that's what people thought. But people are sometimes amazed to find out that there's all kinds of organs inside this body of this shell. 
It goes all the way up to the tip of the shell. I, I brought my little toy model here to show you that up inside that shell are wound the, the liver, the kidney, one kidney, um, the reproductive organs, everything is in there. It's, it's, it's an animal. It has organs just like any other animal. And um, sometimes we actually have to dissect them to figure out what group they belong in. So sometimes this anatomy is pretty important. So all that stuff is inside. They cannot come out of their shell. They, their shell is an integral part of their body, if they have one. And they add to it as they grow. Some of them only get so big, and then they grow a lip on the edge. And so I'll show you some of those in a few minutes. So the land snails have adapted to breathing with a primitive lung. They breathe air. They breathe in oxygen, breathe out carbon dioxide, just like we do. The ones that live in the water have gills. So you can't put a land snail in the water for very long. It takes a while for them to actually drown, but, but you, they can't live in the water permanently. And you can't take a water snail out and put it on land. So if you take a land snail and throw it in your aquarium, you're going to kill it. But the, the ones that, are, that live on land are called the pulmonates because they do have a pulmonary system, uh, a lung. Here in North Carolina, we have a great diversity of land snails. Now, the, <laughs> you've all heard the term little brown bird, the you birders. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the little brown bird, you have no idea what it is. Um, well, we, all of our snails are little brown snails. And the characters to di distinguish them are sometimes very, very subtle. And I, I spent my whole life doing marine shells, and they're pretty much picture book. You know, you open a guidebook and you find the one that matches the shape, and you go, oh, there it is. You can't do that with snails. <laughs> with snails, you have to measure, you have to compare, and you have to, to um, find these fine characters. And sometimes you even have to dissect them. So it's a lot more complicated to, to uh, distinguish them. But we do have a wide range of species from a huge thing like these guys here. These, these were not from this area. This was from Mara Mountain. This is one of our largest shelled snails, which gets up to like 45 millimeters. That's about two and a half to two and three quarters inches. That's pretty big for a land snail. Not the biggest in the world, but it's pretty big. And then we have some that are down to one millimeter as adults. Adults. So um, we have a large range size of snails. And we have about 80 species that we know of so far uh, in the Piedmont of North Carolina. And when we get up here, we start adding more because there's a different species profile up here than there are in Charlotte. The distributions are somewhat limited. So as you move from one side of North Carolina to the other, you get different species coming in. And uh, it's really interesting to get to a new area and study. Most produce a spiral shell. And by the way, this little guy here is one of my favorites. This, this is a, a, a tiger snail. Most of our snails, like I said, are little brown snails. They just have amber shells. They, uh, they all, the shells all look, kind of look the same, except they're different heights or widths or whatever. But this guy actually has stripes on his shell. And it's the only one that we have in our area that actually has a decorated shell. So he's one of my favorites. And I have a couple of them here. So we have various shapes and sizes of native snails. It is in Charlotte. Okay. When we get up here, we have a different species, but we still have a tiger snail. So it's a tiger snail that's not a tiger. Yes. Okay. So you may find a tiger snail, 
but it won't be the same species. Okay, great. Okay. Shell, they hatch from an egg. They never have a shell. When they hatch out, they grow without a shell. This is a native slug, by the way. Kind of looks like a, a job of the hut. <laughs> but <laughs> uh, this is one of our natives that lives in the woods. All of our natives are kind of mottled brown and look just like this big, long, one continuous thing. All snails need moisture to survive, but can survive dry conditions. Fortunately, we be having droughts quite often here lately. Um, but the snails are still there. Sometimes they burrow down into burrows and, and down underground where it, there's still some moisture. But a lot of them just close up seal off the end of their shell and sit and wait. And they can wait for months and months. It's, some of them have been known to be in museum collections, tiny ones, for 20 years. And they decide to wash them and they get up and crawl away. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, I don't know of any of the big ones that can do that, but the tiny ones can. So, where you find them, look under rotting logs and leaf litter in the woods, generally, because they um, like to be where it's moist, and they like to be near their, their food source. They don't like heat, so they're not going to be out in the summer in the hot sun. They might be out at night if it's moist, but they don't like to be out in the hot sun. But they're not adverse to light. So if it's raining and damp one day in the summer, you may see them crawling around and crawling up the side of your house because they, they do like dampness and, um, and cool temperatures. So if it's cool in the summer, you may see them out crawling around. If you see a slime trail, it's probably a slug because slugs have thicker slime and it is stickier. So a slug leaves behind a, a slime trail, whereas another uh, shelled snail usually doesn't. As a matter of fact, we use the slime, the defensive slime. They have different kinds of slime. So we use the defense slime of the slug to determine the species a lot of times, especially if these guys, this is a native slug, that look all alike. So we, we get a toothpick and we agitate him with a toothpick and he gets irritated and throws out his defense slime and it's different colors depending on the different species. So, <laughs> so to, we sit there and, and agitate slugs. This one, if you look close, you can see some yellow slime up there. So that was a, a yellow slimed slug. <laughs> it's a fun job. Some families of snails actually have teeth inside the shell, and they think that this is to keep out predators or discourage predators, because there's a lot of little beetles and things that like to get in there and, and eat the, the snail. So there's all kinds of little armature inside the lip of the shell, and we can use those for identification. And this guy here, this is only about a millimeter and a half. Really, really tiny. Does everybody know what a millimeter is? Do you know what, how big a millimeter is? If you look at a penny, Lincoln's nose sticks out one millimeter. So that's, he's just a little bit bigger than Lincoln's nose on a penny. Native snails are generally decomposers in the forest, and this is an important point. Our native snails are decomposers. Almost every one of our native snails eat only decomposing matter like rotting logs. They do eat fungi, which is not really decomposing at the point, but they do like fungi. They might eat algae. They, um, they eat some roots for plant matter, but they don't eat leafy vegetables. So if you see snails on your lettuce or cabbage, it's probably not a native. 
because our natives are mostly decomposers. And, it, and if you know about ecology, you know that that's a very important part. You've got to have something that breaks down all that stuff out there in the forest, all those leaves that fall every year. Um, all that's got to be recycled into nutrients for the plants. And so the, plant, the, the snails and slugs are a big uh, part of that decomposer community out there that breaks all that matter down. And the snails actually have a, a unique characteristic that helps them to break down things other decomposers can't break down. And I'll tell you about that in a minute. Some of them, however, this guy doesn't eat decaying matter very much. He likes to eat uh, earthworms. So he's predaceous. He, he can uh, eat earthworms and sometimes other small snails. But this one's kind of slow. This is a native, by the way. Um, it, they're very easy to recognize because they've got a very smooth, whitish shell. These happen to have come, I took this picture. These happen to co have come from some red dirt, so they're kind of reddish. But um, they're, they're mostly whitish like this. And they have this huge hole in the bottom called the umbilicus. So they're very easy to recognize. So if you're collecting snails for pets, you don't want to put this one in with your other pet snails. <laughs> um, we have another predaceous one that I'll tell you in about a minute, but this is a, a native one that does live. It's very common around here. This is the, the one that I have up here. This is the rosy wolf snail, the ultimate snail hunter. This one is moving up from the uh, semi-tropics. It was in Florida. It's moved up the coast of North Carolina. It made it up to Wilmington and the Moorhead City area in the 1980s. It's now all the way up to the Virginia line. And it started moving westward. So we have had one um, record of it in Rock Hill, South Carolina, which is just south of Charlotte. So this one, has, it, the distribution is moving. This guy is the ultimate predator. You see these little claspers here? He chases down, okay, it's all relative, okay? <laughs> he chases down, uh, other snails can follow their snail trail, turn in the direction they're going, and catch up with them and eat them grabs them by the, with his claspers and goes in after them. So he is a predator um, of other snails and he can eat one that's bigger than he is. Whoa. Yeah. Um, there's, a, there's an interesting story. Hawaii was having trouble with some invasive snails and they decided well, let's bring this guy in. <laughs> you know, that classic story, one invasive plus another invasive, never works, right? Um, yeah, but he, had, he decided to uh, take a liking to their native snails instead of the invasive, so he just helped the other native wipe them out. Uh, and so now they have a big problem with this guy in, in Hawaii. So. Keep an eye out for these guys, especially if you live in South Carolina. They're moving up this way. And uh, one of my jobs is to keep an eye on things like this. This is one of the reasons why there are people like me out here doing research on snails, is to, to see what is coming and what's the, a threat, what we can do about it, and so forth. Don't know that we can do anything about this one, but um, and I don't know what kind of a threat he might be for our do, native. Do the other snails have any, do they evolve with any awareness that something might hunt them? Or do they mostly rely on shutting themselves up? Shutting themselves up uh, for the ones that have shells is, is their, basically their only defense mechanism. And the ones that have teeth on the inside of the shell doesn't deter this guy at all. Uh, he can eat anything that, that has any kind of armature. <laughs> In the, in the opening. Um, the slugs have that really sticky defense slime that they can throw out, but he'll eat a slug too. So I don't think it works on him. 
So how do they eat? Well, remember I said that they have this unique characteristic that helps them decompose some of the things that other decomposers can't. This is it. They have teeth. So they can actually break down some of the tough stuff, the veins of leaves, rotting wood, the, th the things that earthworms and other decomposers can't break through. So he's a, these snails are a primary decomposer in that they start the decomposer process, they break things down so other decomposers can continue to break them down. And this is how they do it. They have this, these rows and rows and rows and rows of tiny teeth like a file. It's called a radula. And it's on a tongue-like mechanism that he scrapes across the, the surface and scrapes the material off. And you can see this in a trail going up the side of the house sometimes. If you've ever seen a real squiggly trail, that's the snail going along scraping his tongue. Um, and if you have one in an aquarium, a water snail, you can see it crawling up the side and you can actually see it scraping the side of the, the aquarium. But, um, and, and if you hold one of these big guys in your hand, you can feel the tickle of the, the radula. These guys can't really hurt you. It just tickles a little bit. There's one that lives up here in the mountains, though, that'll make you drop it. It's kind of got yeah. Almost all of them are hermaphroditic. Um, land snails, 99% of them are hermaphroditic, we mean, which means that they're both male and female in the same individual. So all they need is another one of the same species. And sometimes they don't even need that because some of them can self-fertilize in, in desperation. I guess this is an adaptation to being so sparsely distributed out in, in nature that they might not run into each other very often. So they need to hedge their bets. If they run into anybody of the same species, that's good. Um, they can lay hundreds of eggs at one time and they can store the sperm for a long period of time and lay successive batches of eggs from one mating so they don't have to, to mate every time. So they manage to reproduce quite well. The young look like little adults with only one or two whorls. They, they, have, they start here with a tiny, tiny little whorl and they keep adding to it. So when they're born, when they're hatched from an egg, all of them lay eggs, all the land uh, snails. Uh, they only have one or two little whorls and they start building on that. So, my model's falling apart. So um, these are just some of the native land snails that we have, just to show you some of the diversity of the different kinds. They're beautiful. Some of them have engraved lines on them. Some of them look like little beehives. Some of them have ribs and armature in their aperture. Here's some more. Some of those teeny tiny little guys. Um, this one is hairy. Kind of hard to tell in that picture because it's wet. The shell is hairy. The hairy snail. This is a very common one. I think I've got one in container here. Here's a very glossy one called a smooth button snail. It's very black body with a Roman nose. Very distinctive. Distinguishing it between species is a little difficult, but, um, but you could tell it's a mesomphix anyway. This one has a basket weave pattern on the shell. Um, this is the, the big one that I have in the container here. It's called the white-lipped forest snail. It's one of the most common ones where I live. That's why I have so many of them. Came out of my yard. These are some micro snails that uh, I took that picture. I had a really good bag of dirt. <laughs> These were, all came out of one sample and I was just absolutely excited about this and I took this picture through my microscope. These guys, this is about 
uh, 1.5 millimeters here. So some of these are one millimeter, about 1.1. So they're a little bigger than Lincoln's nose. But that was a good day. I spend a lot of time going through dirt. I collect dirt from an area and there's a difference between good dirt and bad dirt. I try to get good snail dirt. And I, um, I call it dirt, but it's actually the, the decomposing leaf litter, the, the duff below the dry leaves, not the mineral dirt, but that area in between the dry leaves and the, the actual dirt dirt. And um, I will dry it, sift it several times, get it in different size particles, and then I go through it under microscope a teaspoon at a time. And that was a good day. Well, most of those are alive, right? Um, no, those are mostly dead. Occasionally I will get some live ones in the dirt because they survived the drying process and the sieving process. Um, but most of these are probably already dead. Yeah. And there is a lot of excitement in the snail world. You think being in North Carolina around a metropolitan area like Charlotte, you think scientists know everything there is there, right? No. Two brand new species of snails that we are now describing and naming in the Charlotte area. Um, this one is one that I'm working on. This is a pair of atria. And uh, we found it in Cleveland County. Cleveland County is the county where Shelby is, Boiling Springs. Um, this one has never been found anywhere else, but it's locally abundant in Cleveland County. And there were no records of snails in Cleveland County five years ago. So, yes, it's very translucent. And actually, the body of this animal, the live animal, is white, except for the tips of its eyes. And um, the shell is also transparent. So this little guy is white. It's beautiful, absolutely beautiful. We're trying to find an adult. We've been able to raise them to almost adult, but we need an adult so that we can do the, the uh, anatomy work on the reproductive system. And we haven't been able to find one yet. So, uh-huh. That depends on the snail itself. I have had some, like these big ones here, live for eight years in captivity. In the nature, they might, going through winters and everything, they might live three or four years. Um, but these little guys are probably annual. The little tiny things, these, the largest one we found was 3.5 millimeters. Uh, these guys, uh, the big ones, will take two years. Uh, these will probably grow up and, and die a couple of, couple of um, broods a year. So it doesn't take them very long, a couple of months maybe. And then there's one snail down in the, the acidic pocasins in eastern North Carolina, down in the swamps, that live in such an acidic environment. And if you remember your biology or your chemistry, acid, calcium carbonate that their shells are made of, they just don't mix. You know, it's like putting an egg in vinegar. The, it'll dissolve the shell from around the egg. So that's what would happen to a snail if it's in an acidic environment. So um, these little snails down in this swamp hatch out from their eggs, grow up, lay more eggs, and die within three weeks. And as they're dying, their shells are already dissolving from around them. They only can do this when they get a lot of rain in the spring and the, the fresh water coming into the snow dilutes the acid to the point that they can do this. It's just, a, it's just amazing to me 
But when they bloom, when it happens, there are millions of these snails everywhere. It's just incredible. <laughs> I, I, I don't know how they manage to do that, but a land snail has a problem growing out in, in the woods because the decomposing matter in the forest floor is acidic. So they're constantly fighting being dissolved. And uh, the shells, the empty shells of dead snails don't last all that long. They either get eaten by another snail that recycles the calcium, because they have trouble getting calcium, or they just dissolve in the acidic environment. So um, it's, it's an interesting lifestyle that they live. That's a good point. A slug doesn't have to build the shell. So a slug can actually live in a more acidic environment than a snail can. And maybe one of the adaptations of being a slug, that and the fact that it can squeeze into crevices that a, one with a shell can't get into. Um, when we go looking for snails, we always look for hardwood logs because pine logs are just way too acidic for most snails. However, sometimes we find slugs under the bark of pine, rotting pine logs because they can and it's a niche. So there they are. <laughs> but you rarely find any shelled snails under the bark of pine logs because of that reason. It's fascinating. The ecology of snails, it, it would be a really fascinating thing to, to study. We are just now beginning to use the DNA to determine species and to sort out this craziness between families and species and genera and, and, uh, and, and nope, they haven't gotten that far yet. So that would be interesting. It would be fascinating. This is another one that uh, my colleague up in Boone is working on here. This, is, this little guy is kind of cute. He's got, actually got fringes they're hard to see on here, but they're spiral uh, fringes around his shell. It's tiny too, but she's, she's working on that one. And it's also found in the Piedmont. So, science being done. Okay, very quickly, I've been talking about native snails so far. Now I'd like to talk to you about the ones that are not native, the ones that we might be more familiar with because they're in our urban environment and likely to be around our homes. So invasion at a snail's pace is what I call this because they are invading and it's so slow we don't realize it. A lot of invading exotic invasive species, right? Kudzu. Everybody knows about fire ants and starlings, and we've heard of zebra mussels, right, in the waterways, but snails? Yep. These are non -native. Um, Things that you might be familiar with, the giant leopard slug, the little tiny white hedgehog slug. You may not have seen that one, but I find it out in the woods. Um, and then this one, this one is kind of, uh, kind of gross. It, if you pick it up, it turns your hand Kool-Aid orange. And then these were little yellow guys that came in on bedding plants that were in my backyard. They're not native. So how did they get here? Hitchhikers, released pets. That's why we don't exotic snails as pets here. Uh, food markets, aquarium and pond supply for water snails. Uh, you can buy snails for your pond. You can buy snails for your aquarium. Sometimes they come with your grass and stuff, or the plants for your aquarium. You don't realize it. They get spread around that way. Landscaping and bedding plants, that's a big way that snails move. And sometimes just the natural population drift like this, this guy here. 
But my, my husband one day drove his car from our house in Bessemer City about an hour to Charlotte, stopped to put air in his tire, and there was a little snail on the inside of the wheel that had gone around and 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 around, all the way to Charlotte and was still hanging on. So they attach to anything. Railroad track banks are fascinating places for us malacologists. <laughs> Things on containers and fall off on, on, along the way on railroad tracks and sometimes form populations and there's some weird stuff on the side of a railroad track. <laughs> so we do have laws. They realize that snails can be transported easily. So if you've ever gone overseas and come back, you have that customs. Do you have any snails? It's specific. They ask you specifically, do you have any snails? And I always have a hard time answering that. <laughs> I do try not, I do, don't bring in live snails from overseas, but do snail shells count? And I always wonder if I should ask or not. Um, but <laughs> it's not, it's a minor bureaucracy. Yeah. <laughs> but importation of live snails into the U.S. is definitely a no-no, and they will stop you at the border. Raising exotic snails in North Carolina is prohibited. Necessarily true of all states. So we do have some states that, that raising escargot is, is allowed. In North Carolina, you are not allowed to possess a live escargot snail. You have to get your escargot either frozen or in a can in North Carolina. <laughs> you cannot have it fresh. So if, if the restaurant tells you it's fresh, don't believe them. Uh, you're not allowed to transport soil into the U.S. and across state lines, and people don't realize this. You're not really allowed to bring that plant from another state if it's got a pot full of soil. Um, and then, of course, there's all kinds of regulation of commercial shipment of foods and things, and you're not allowed to have exotic snails as pets. And, of course, you're not allowed to release any exotic species out into the wild. So here's some of the bad guys. The leopard slug, we all know the leopard slug, right? Big old guy, gets huge. It's one of our, the worst ones for eating our plants. Um, they've been in, in the U.S. for 100, 100 years or more. Um, all over the U.S. And they're an urban pest. They can grow anywhere. They can live in Florida. They can live in Canada. Just incredibly uh, adaptive. And there's some of his relatives. Lots of different kinds of these um, exotic slugs. So how do you tell an exotic slug from a native slug? Well, all of them have this, they're a different family of slug. And they all have this thing that looks like a saddle on their back, right there. A native slug looks like it's all one piece. So if you look at it closely, you can see there's a little saddle on its back. So these also have saddles. See the saddle? It's hard to see that one, but it does have a saddle. That one has a saddle. So, oops, it's up there. Um, so that's how you tell a native slug from a, um, nat a native slug from an exotic one. The helicid snails are the ones they eat in Europe as escargot, and these guys um, are not native to the U.S. Them are. This is what it looks like in Europe. If you've ever been to Europe, you've probably seen the snails on the walls. They live above ground. They like to be up in trees. They crawl up living green plants and eat them. Ours don't eat them. Living plants. If they do, they're just getting the moisture from the dew. 
This is what an escargot snail looks like, and sometimes they use this species too, but they're, they're big, bigger than the ones we have here. And they're quite a problem in Europe. This is one that we have currently in our rivers. If you're ever out fishing one day and see these guys, don't get panicky. They get to be about four inches long. Um, these came from the Asian food market. And it's thought that they might have even been planted in the rivers for harvest. Uh, they're, they're eaten in the, the uh, Asian food market. As a matter of fact, I have some in an aquarium at home right now that were given to me by somebody who went to an Asian food market and saw them crawling around, took a few home for her aquarium, and they laid eggs and had babies, and so she gave me some of the babies. Um, we don't know what impact these are gonna have on us yet. They, this is a recent thing. Uh, they eat the detritus on the bottom of the river, so they're not really eating any plants or animals. So we don't know what they're going to do. Oh yes. Mm-hmm. Yep. And they were planted in the them and and have a supply. Yeah. So. Here's the real bad guy. This is the one that was in Florida back in the '60s, and they tried to eradicate it. They did eradicated as far as they knew. Um, but it all started when a little boy had, a, had some pet snails and his grandmother got mad one day and threw them out in the backyard. This is the giant African snail. And those are two, two snails there, but you see how big they are. Um, they can stretch out as big as a man's forearm. Uh, then the shell can get to be eight inches long. They're pretty big, and they eat at least 500 different types of plants. And they also eat the stucco up off the houses in, in Florida for the calcium. Yep. And they're self-fertilizing. And they can lay 900 eggs at once. And the eggs can stay viable for 11 years without hatching. Yeah. <laughs> Well, they just recently, about five years ago, got loose in Florida again. And there's, there was a big article about a woman that was caught in the airport with 20 of them under her skirt coming in. Um, some cultures eat them. They're the Caribbean, they're, they're a great delicacy in the Caribbean and in, in different countries, they're eaten. Um, so they came in as, as food in the food market. Um, they used to be kept as pets in schools. Back in the 60s, they went around and collected them all and destroyed them after they got loose the first time. So anyway, that's a giant African snail. They're, they're working on eradicating them. They think they've got a handle on them right now, but it, only time will tell. So how do you prevent it or slow it down? Avoid transporting soil or snails to another area. Don't release your aquarium snails into ponds. If you pick up snail shells as souvenirs on the beach or in the, the forest or in other countries, make sure they're empty because they can sleep for a long time. They go into what's called estivation and they just sit there and you can't tell that they're alive. Prob yes, probably so. Or if you hold them up to the light, you can see a body in there. Um, if you find any large or exotic snails that we're not aware of, please report them. Um, you can report them to me. I'm in contact with the Wildlife Commission all the time. I can report them. Um, the Wildlife Commission themselves would like to know, but right now, North Carolina does not have any populations of the escargot snail or the giant African snail. Both of them, it's possible they could live in North Carolina. So we're constantly on the lookout. We're on the lookout for this guy. 
So if you see anything unusual like that, please let us know. And come to programs like this and learn more about it. So I'm going to let you look at some of these things if you haven't already and ask me questions. Uh, I'm at the Shield Museum. I'm behind the scenes. You, you won't see me if you walk through the museum. But if you ever want to come visit us, we love to have visitors. We're just not open to the public. Just make an appointment with us. Let us know. And we'll be glad to give you a tour of our collections department. I have over 16,000 specimens in my collection. Uh, we also have a, an entomologist with an insect collection that has over 70,000 arthropods, um, including spiders and, and uh, isopods and other arthropods. Uh, we have one of the largest mycology collections in the southeast. Um, Eileen Stanley and, and Deborah Langsam and um, Mimi Harrington work on that. So we have quite a few things that people don't realize we have at the Shield Museum. And we're always welcoming visitors to come by and, and visit with us. You just need to make an appointment. So. Any questions before? Yes? Can I hear you say that snails will crawl into empty snail shells sometimes? Um, they will crawl. The small ones will crawl into bigger shells just to get the calcium and, and to hide. Yeah, so uh, actually if we find dead snail shells out when we're collecting, we bring them back and we wash them because when we wash them, we wash out the little guys from the inside. <laughs> and we get a lot of very tiny snails that way that have crawled into the bigger shells. Um, they don't attach themselves to it. No, they don't live in it as in adopt it as their own shell. They just, yeah, they just go in it to, to hide and to eat it. Um, it's a source of calcium for them. Any other questions? Some good questions today. It's hard to tell, especially if it's dirty. Uh, so that's why we always soak them in water and wash them real good, and then we, we strain the dirt that comes out of them to look for the little ones um, because they hide in there. Um, but it. The easiest way, like I said, is to hold it up to the light and see if you see a body in there and to, to see how heavy it is. And you can kind of tell from the, the weight of it and the looking through it through a, at, in front of a light whether there's a body of, of the snail in there. Or like somebody said, put it in a container with a wet paper towel. And if it's just sleeping, it'll come out and start crawling around. And it, it was curious that we were hiking yesterday up in the mountain. Mm -hmm. I saw the snail at about big red only maybe half dollar brown swirl and it was I never saw one that big just walking along. Yeah, there is one up in the mountains that's about this size. It's not this species, but it's about this size. And um it's it's a hefty snail if you see them up in the mountains. I don't have them down in my area, the Piedmont, but up in the mountains, there are some this big. Yes? The, um, the ones that have the transparent um, shell, mm -hmm. are they putting down the spirals quickly? It takes them. It's such a short time, you said when they're hatched, mm -hmm. they have only one or two squirrels, but if they live a short time, yeah, they can put them down relatively quickly. And, um, sometimes, sometimes when I collect snails, they get damaged a little bit from handling. I'll break the lip off or, um, or something, and overnight they can repair that. Um, now, as they grow, so it depends on the, the snail how fast they grow, but those little transparent, it takes them fully grown. We haven't been able to grow them fully to adulthood yet, but we've we've had some live babies. So, so they're depositing the calcium all the time, not just it's not 
tree rings annually. It's not tree rings, but there are growth lines. So it's not continuous. They, they, they'll put down a layer and then wait, and then put down another layer and wait. So you can see in some, it's more obvious than others that there are growth wrinkles or growth lines where they added a section. Um, it's sort of sporadic, the, the way they add the, the calcium. Did you? Um, two questions. Uh, do they have a special organ that adds, grows their shell, and does the, do the lines correspond perhaps to how much calcium they're able to get? Um, yes, in both, to both questions. There's an organ called the mantle. The mantle is the part of the, um, the snail that is common to octopus, clams, squid. That's what makes an, a mollusk a mollusk. And that mantle is what generates the shell. Uh, you can see the, in an octopus it's the, the covering over the back of the, the body of the octopus. In a uh, squid, it's the cover over the body of the squid. For a clam, it's the inside, that membrane on the inside of the shell. And for a snail, it covers his body just like that on the inside of the shell, all the way around the shell and on the inside. And that's what generates that shell. And on the slug, it was the saddle. That was the mantle. The mantle of a native slug covers the whole body, so it all looks one piece. So the mantle is the part that covers, that makes the shell. And then, um, what was the other question? <laughs> do, do, they, do the lines correspond to oh, they, they got some calcium? They it definitely them. makes a difference how much calcium they have as to how the lines are laid down. If they don't have enough calcium, and I have seen this in some of my captive snails, uh, the, the lines get pretty distorted and erratic, so it makes a difference. And I'm sure that in some cases they just can't grow a shell, so they just sit there. That's a good question. There are several layers to the shell, and I really, you know, I've not thought about that. I know with the, um, the marine shells, they're laid down outside in. I'm not sure if the land snails do the same thing. But that's a good question. Yes? Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, I wouldn't think of them as maybe they are, but, but they're, you know, sort of maybe on the edge of the pond, but in the water. Are those land snails or are those, what are they? Uh, if they stay in the water, if they live in the water, they are aquatic snails and they have, okay. I, well, some of them have gills. There are some that live in the water that go to the surface and get air an air bubble and take it back down and, and stay for a long time and then go back up. Um, the little ones that, that everybody fights in aquaria, have you ever gotten plants in an aquarium and had snails, the little black ones? Those are water air, like pulmonates. Um, they go up to the top and get air and some of those live in the ponds. So there's, there's a mixture in the ponds. And there are actually some land snails that are related to the aquatic snails that actually have some modified gill as, it's weird, but it's only like one family of uh, land snail. Do they have any sense of smell? The little things here on the front, these little feelers, these are the eye stalks, by the way. These little round things on the, on the top are the eye the eyes themselves, um, and these little things are chemical receptors. I'm not sure if you would really call it a sense of smell like our olfactory system, but it, they detect chemicals and they can detect um, food from a distance away. So 
um, I'm assuming they can detect it almost like smell. So I'm, I'm not sure if that is like ours, but it, it is a chemical receptor like our sense of smell. Do they have a brain? Are the eyes, are they attached to a brain? That's a very good question. They do have um, a fairly sophisticated system, but as far as a brain is concerned, they have the rudimentary um, beginnings of a brain, but it's very, very small, very limited. Um, but it's enough that they can learn. They actually can learn patterns and, and um, learn to adapt to certain conditions. So yes, in a way they do have a brain, but not a real thinking brain. Like we, not, a, not like a dog or... Like an, octopus. an octopus is another matter. Yeah. An octopus has actually evolved eyes very much like ours. And just a, a, um, a it's a really strange adaptation that they, they were ma managed in a different, totally different lineage, able to come up with the same kind of eye that we do. Um, in, in, in very basic terms, not exactly. Um, and they have a much bigger brain than our land snails do. So an octopus is a much more advanced mollusk <laughs> than our land snails. Yes? Is there any sense of evolutionary pattern which is the oldest how they evolve? We have a whole uh, phylogenetic tree of uh, the mollusk um, and several branches go off like the cephalopods, the, the, the octopus and the ammonites and so forth are do totally different early branch. Um, and the land snails are considered way out on the tip of the gastropods. They're, they're uh, pretty advanced as far as gastropods are concerned. The, the marine gastropods are, for the most part, further down the tree. So they, we do have a phylogenetic tree. Phylog, uh, phylogenesis is the, the study of the evolutionary um, branching that the whole group went through. How much do you think snails actually see? I mean, all right, they have eyes, but mm -hmm. what do they see? They pretty much only see light and dark. And we're talking about land snails here. Right. Um, they can see light and dark. They, they obviously know when a shadow comes over them, um, they will react. But um, as far as images, they can't distinguish any kind of images. They mostly live off of chemical To all the mollusk? Yes. How far back? When I was in college, and I'm, this may have changed since then, when I was in college, it was called the hypothetical ancestral mollusk. <laughs> Ham. <laughs> That's what we called him. It had a mantle. It had chemical receptors on it. It had a foot and the usual organs inside. And it had paired organs which the gastropods lost when they developed the spiral shell. They lost one side. So yes, we do have a model of an ancestral mollusk, but we don't have an, an actual representative that meets that model. We don't know what species or family that was. How far back? Oh, mollusks have been around since some of the earliest days of life in the oceans. They had conical shapes, shells to begin with before they spiraled. And uh, they were very, very, they, they may not know where the original mollusk came from. But they're somewhere in there between annelids, the earthworms, and the arthropods. Somewhere in there. Great questions, my goodness. <laughs> Thank you.